the design company, and then we will continue to invite master to share their experience with us. The master today is Professor Sebastian Crutch. Dr. Crutch is Professor of Neuropsychology at the Dementia Research Center, UCL Institute of Neurology, UK. And uh, he is the clinical lead for rare dementia support. His research focuses on rare and young onset dementia, especially posterior cortical atrophy. I think he is the, one of the uh, members who uh, established the diagnosis of criteria uh, in uh, PCA. The title of his talk today is Do I See What You See? Perspectives on Posterior Cortical Atrophy. Let's welcome Professor Crouch, please. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me okay, and thank you very much for this uh, kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, if there are any problems with the um, technical aspects, please do wave and shout at me, and I will try and speak clearly or um, have colleagues there share the slides instead. Um, and I will try and whistle through, I will try and go quite quickly through a number of different um, topics and areas of research. Um, so just to so I'm very happy to share a PDF of these slides after the meeting um, in case that's helpful for people um, rather than scribbling notes as I speak. So um, this topic, I don't know how many amongst the audience have worked with people living with posterior cortical atrophy or PCA before, um, but this is a syndrome, a progressive syndrome that affects the back of the brain as the, as the name suggests, it's literally back of the brain shrinkage. Um, and I thought the best thing to do is to start with a couple of clinical stories, anecdotes and videos to try and give you a sense of what it is, this condition that we're talking about. So perhaps the best place to start is with Frank Benson, the American neurologist who named this syndrome in the late 80s, um, describing one of the five people in his original case series. So uh, I'll just read aloud. As he said, one of his patients was a 64-year-old former bank executive who presented with episodes of anxiety that complicated a slowly uh, progressive disturbance of vision and language. And about eight years earlier, he had noticed difficulty reading. He remained in his job, but his secretary had to read to him. Although he was still able to write, he could not read what he had written, what he produced. Eventually, he also lost the ability to write and had difficulty finding his way in familiar places and in performing visually mediated tasks. His problems slowly progressed and he stated that what he saw disappeared before he could sense what it was. On examination, he was alert, oriented, attentive and in reasonably good physical health. His manner was gracious and his insight was painfully apparent. So here we've got a really interesting progressive picture. There's clearly something progressive and cognitive going on, but it's not the classic Alzheimer's picture. Good memory, good insight, preponderance of difficulties with, with vision, particularly difficulty seeing what and where things are. Um, and as uh, Frank Benson went on to describe, this is down to prominent atrophy at the back of the brain. And uh, we'll talk a little bit later on about causes, but, but Alzheimer's disease is uh, overwhelmingly the most common cause and the, this is a young onset condition so the mean age of onset for people is 58 years um, but often people have quite a delayed route to diagnosis while people think that they don't have dementia because they're too young and because they're describing visual problems which initially a lot of people assume is something to do with the eye rather than the brain but just to be clear this is a brain sight condition not an eyesight condition these people have good eyesight good ophthalmic health and it's a difficulty at the back of the brain interpreting what is coming in from the world around them. Um, so if I move on to a couple of videos, um, I'll just play this. This is a, a, a stick motion figure um, from Keir Yong's research in our movement lab of someone just approaching a chair, the arms of which are shown, and attempting to sit down. Um, uh, just make sure that I can keep playing. Um, this person attempts to sit down, but actually can't perceive the orientation of the chair, so ends up sitting um, on the arm of the chair um, and then moving around to try and um, resit themselves. And this, again, uh, aligns with Frank Benson's original 
uh, comment where about that patient, he said he walked as though blind, but could navigate the room without colliding into anything. When offered a chair, he had difficulty finding it. And when he did, he sat on the arm before correctly seating himself. Now, I'd like you to look at my... So next, I'm going to show you a quick video of one of my colleagues, Professor Jonathan Schott, um, interviewing someone with PCA um, to show some of the difficulty um, with perceiving the location, uh, so seeing where uh, something is. And this is a common clinical test where he just asks someone um, to reach out and grab their hand whilst fixating centrally. And I'm going to put my hands out, and I'm going to move my hand. And if you see my hand moving, can you reach and grab it? So look at my nose. <laughs> there you go. Got it. Well done. Look at my nose. Can you look at my nose. Can you find my hand. Can you see my hand moving? No, I can see your nose. Mm. Can you see a hand at all? Can you see my hand moving? No. Uh, is that keeping my... I'm oh, sorry, the video seems to have paused itself. I'm just going to see if I can... Now, I'd like you to look at my nose. Moving. No, I can see your nose. Mm. Can you see a hand at all? Can you see my hand moving? No. Uh, is that keeping my... Yeah. Keep looking at me. Can you see my hand moving? Can you see my hand moving? Yeah. Can you see my hand? Yes. Grab it yes. for me. Where is it? <laughs> where is it? You got it. God, where is it? You'll find it in a minute. Wow. Ah. <laughs> you got it. Very good. Well done. Okay. Okay, so as I hope you could tell there, this un person understood very clearly what they were being asked to do. He understood he needed to look at the face and reach to the hand. Um, but the parts of his brain, which are calculating in X, Y, and Z coordinates, where where something is in space relative to him, are, dysf are dysfunctional. So he's able, eventually, initially can't see the hand at all. Then you can see his head sort of jerk back as he notices the hand, but then he reaches to the wrong location in space. And so this ocular motor apraxia deficit um, it means that the, the target coordinates have been miscalculated. Um, it looks like a, a pop. Sorry, on this next video, I'm going to be describe. This is someone who also with PCA who is attempting to describe the photo in front of you. So this is a photo of Brighton Pier in the south of England. And the person is just simply being shown this photo and asked um, to say what it is. And I'll just let you listen to her description. It looks like a, a park or, um, or maybe a station. Or a building site looks a bit like um, the thing they're trying to elect for the, uh, the uh, Olympics. <laughs> or it could be the beach. Because down here it looks a bit sandy. Well, it looks like Brighton. Brighton or somewhere like that. So you're looking at it. So sorry, not very good audio quality, but I hope what you could hear her say was revealing that she, unlike you and I, couldn't understand immediately what this image was that she was looking at. We probably in two or three hundred milliseconds would be able to understand that this was an outside scene. And then that idea would guide our subsequent eye movements around the scene as we inspect the different details of this image. Whereas for this lady, she was seeing the world as if in chunks, as if in small pieces. So at one point, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but she was perhaps looking at the legs of the pier when she said, um, oh, it could be a, a railway or a station. Perhaps she was seeing these um, as the sleepers along, along a railway track. 
and at another point she said oh it's like what they're trying to build for the Olymp or erect for the olympics perhaps she was looking at this um, object at the end this building at the end of the pier and thinking it looked like a sports stadium and then it's only towards the end that she's able to pull all these different pieces of the puzzle together into a coherent whole and use her intact knowledge of the world language semantics to um, determine that this might be a beach scene um, so she, she's got a very fragmented and broken perception of the world around her. So all of these difficulties, these difficulties seeing what things are, where they are, and many other um, posterior cortical um, aspects of dysfunction as well, including apraxia, dyslexia, dysgraphia, they're all happening because of this atrophy at the back of the brain. So here you see um, some cortical thinning maps in which we compared 48 people with PCA to 30 people with memory-led Alzheimer's disease. And the hot colors show where people with PCA had thinner um, cortical um, tissue. Um, and the cold colors show the, show the reverse contrast, where people with memory-led Alzheimer's disease um, had thinner um, cortex. So you can see this very much, this posterior um, uh, orientation or profile um, to their atrophy patterns. And of course, this is a, as we said right at the beginning, this is a, this is a progressive difficulty. Um, this is just a single case study, somebody who we originally met um, as they entered as a control into a subjective memory a complaint study. But actually, over time, they said, oh, actually, I'm not really worried about my memory. Um, that doesn't seem so much the problem. And so they were scanned at yearly intervals over a number of years. And what you see in this second row is all of the, is the first scan in 2004 registered against each of the subsequent scans with um, this green color being shown is a voxel compression map showing where tissue is being lost. So again, you see this posterior um, distribution to the atrophy. Uh, it's very much the back of the brain initially that's shrinking. And below you can see the different cognitive um, uh, disabilities or weaknesses that emerged on, on repeat clinical interview and neuropsychological testing. And as you can see, it's only uh, very late in the day that verbal memory became an issue. Prior to that, it was these problems of literacy and numeracy um, and particularly difficulty with any kind of visually oriented test. And that reflects the fact that when you look at much larger cohorts of people in individuals with PCA, as we'll say, as we'll talk about in a moment, caused by Alzheimer's disease, you see the most prominent atrophy and the highest rate of atrophy in the occipital and parietal uh, regions. And in PCA, lower and slower atrophy, progressive atrophy in the more typical um, areas associated with memory functions, such as the entorhinal cortex and the hippocampus. And that's not to say that they, this is only affecting the back of the brain. Clearly, the, this disease um, spreads and you get quite global atrophy, um, but it never approaches the rate of atrophy um, and the extent of atrophy in those regions never approaches um, the extent of atrophy at the back of the brain. So you always have, even late into the disease, often quite a distinct clinical profile. So let's talk a little bit about diagnosis and assessment. I won't go through these tests in detail, but it's just these sli uh, next few slides are just to highlight that there are a number of different uh, visual Of course, there are. Oh, sorry, I've got a bit of audio recording on that one, it would seem. Um, this is a quick example of some tests that my, uh, my mentor, Elizabeth Warrington, pulled together into the Queen Square um, Book of Testing um, Skills. Um, so I just go back up to that. So you can see you've got a variety of tests for testing the most basic aspects um, of visual function, such as um, shape detection, color discrimination, size discrimination, some object perception tasks. And we'll talk about this fragmented letters test in a bit more, where you have to kind of cohere, you have to get some kind of gestalt sense of, of what an object is based on stitching together um, different fragments um, of, of visual stimulus um, or, for example, difficulty seeing usual and unusual views. So particularly um, people with PCA have difficulty seeing objects from any angle, but particularly when it's viewed from an unfamiliar angle or in non-ideal conditions. So clinically, people often talk about misrecognizing things um, under low lighting conditions or when it's too bright and shiny. And of course, a, a series of um, spatial, spatially demanding visual tests as well.
and what we see um, is that you can, there are tests um, that are particularly good at discriminating people with PCA uh, from typical Alzheimer's disease. Um, but there are also uh, these visual complaints are not restricted only to people with PCA. And a, a big point is of, of our work with people with PCA is to flag up the dementia related visual impairments that are seen in a whole variety of different people. Um, certainly with Alzheimer's disease, with dementia, with Lewy bodies. So just to orient you on this graph, the x-axis is the percentage of people with typical memory-led Alzheimer's disease who fail some of these visual tasks. So for example, this spatial test here, the number location test, um, is incredibly difficult for PC people with PCA. This is the PCA failure rate up the side, and you can see this test is failed by over 90% of people with even early stage PCA. But it's also failed by over 50% of people with memory-led Alzheimer's disease. This is a very cognitively demanding task, and clearly the, pro the typical kind of temporoparietal Alzheimer's disease pattern associated with memory-led Alzheimer's disease does involve not just memory, but also some of these wider um, spatial concerns. Whereas this fragmented letters test is also is 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 a, is another one where you also see um, impairment early on. It's impossible for the vast majority of people with PCA, but also difficult for a number of people with um, with AD. However, there are some other tasks that are worth noting. This crowding test, where you simply have to report the the central letter amongst clutter, in this case, letter numbers, um, is something that is very difficult for people with PCA. But no one with Alzheimer's with memory dead Alzheimer's disease, in our experience, fails. And there are other tasks that point out it's not every aspect of vision that's effective. So acuity, the ability to see small things, particularly when tested appropriately, as in this test. Um, where you can just see one one item at a time and just say, is this a, a triangle, a square, or a circle? As the as the, as those stimuli get smaller and smaller and smaller, is something which is relatively well preserved, um, suggesting that the most very most basic visual cortices are relatively protected from this progressive um, atrophy over time. Um, Another thing to point out in terms of clinical and diagnosis is that a lot of people with PCA will end up seeing first eye health professionals, perhaps a high street optician when they go to buy a new pair of glasses, and then perhaps a hospital optometrist um, or ophthalmologist. Um, and so in this review by Gordon Plant and colleagues, um, they were strongly suggesting that there are certain clues, certain red flags um, for our our vision health colleagues that, that they really need to take into account. So particularly things, problems with spatial orientation. Um, they also flag up the fact that the Ishihara plates, even on the practice plate with no color, um, that people with PCA have great difficulty because it's one of these fragmented letters, fragmented images that we've been talk, talked about. So they can fail that not because they've got a color vision problem, but because they've got a problem with this basic form perception. Um, and also homonymous deficits on perimetry, and this tendency um, also to to omit letters on the acuity chart if you're going through a standard visual chart, which I'll show you in a moment. So certain things that if you've seen, you heard these stories before, or met people with this condition, you can pick out quite clearly in the clinical history. Um, and this is just a very very briefly to say that these tests are being developed um, by my colleague Keir Yong. Lot that obviously there are lots of different visual tests out there, and so Keir um, is working with colleagues as part of the Alzheimer's Association atypical um, Alzheimer's um, peer or professional interest area to get global consensus on which are the most sensitive tests. This fragmented letter test is one that seems particularly helpful, um, and so we're currently um, using a version of this in the UK Biobank study of health of 60,000 healthy volunteers. Um, to try and determine the rates of failure of this test. I mean, in a graded version of the test, people with PCA are struggling to identify the letter, even at this mild level of fragmentation, whereas um, healthy individuals or individuals with eye, various eye health conditions are often able to determine the letter right down to these um, very, very, very fragmented um, states. Um, so it's something that hopefully we'll be able to roll out into um, eye clinics and, uh, and other clinical services soon. Uh, now, Professor Hugh, at the beginning, very kindly mentioned um, the consensus criteria. So this was an effort a number of years ago to bring different centres together, different clinicians together, to get agreement about what we mean by PCA. And uh, the essential agreement that we came with 
uh, is that we divided PCA up into a syndromic description, which you're seeing here, and a disease level description, which I'll show you in a moment. So at this, syn at this uh, syndromic level, we had PCA, which is a list of um, determined by um, a list of clinical criteria, which I'll show you in a moment. But also we had this separation into PCA pure and PCA plus. And that really signifies the PCA pure is just to signify people who only meet the criteria for the PCA syndrome. And the PCA plus is people who would meet the criteria for the PCA syndrome, but also meet the criteria for another clinical syndrome. And that was just to capture the fact that a number of people um, uh, may have PCA as a result of something, for example, Lewy body disease, where there will be other symptoms, say hallucinations, REM sleep disorder, where one might be tempted to think, oh, they've got hallucinations, REM sleep disorder, it's Lewy body disease or dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, and that neglects the these other wider um, PCA-like uh, visual and non-visual phenomena. So we just had that distinction in there um, uh, to incorporate a, a wider group of people. Um, but these are this is a, a wide and heterogeneous syndrome. And uh, just to give you um, a, a little bit of an idea, on the right here, I'm just listing out um, the clinical um, um, the essential elements of the clinical um, syndrome. Um, and our consensus criteria suggested that in order to have uh, a diagnosis of PCA, you'd need to see at least three of these, plus obviously other criteria like progressive change in these disorders. But one of the things I was just going to, in terms of trying to be useful, that we regret not doing more of within those clinical tri criteria is to flag up some of the clinical issues that you'd see across the desk in the initial history, uh, which are just a real telltale signs of PCA. So just to go through, a couple of those disorders of color perception are often quite common. Um, so we've had lots of people with PCA who said the first thing that they noticed was, for example, when driving at night, um, they would have washes of color, perhaps purple um, color, um, a color after image um, when other cars drove past them that was quite distracting, made it very difficult to drive. Other people have described it clinically that in the real world, when they're seeing lots of one color, Whereas all of us might, after staring at one color, then looking away, might have a brief complementary color after image. For PCA, those color after images seem particularly strong. So just as an example, one of our patients, when watching England playing football in their white shirts against the green grass of Wembley Stadium, turned to her husband and asked, why are England playing in pink tonight? And that's because this color after image is so strong, so unbounded, so disinhibited, um, that the green and the complementary red color after image spill over and are seen at the same time. Another um, key example is often people have great difficulty um, with manipulating simple and complex objects. So people who do technical jobs struggling um, with the devices they use, lots of people struggling to enter information on a computer because of this spatial challenges of you know, hitting the right key, people having problems with the TV remote. Another classic um, is people having difficulty dressing. Lots of people with PCA come to their first appointment saying, oh, for a while now I've had been having difficulty getting my, my shirt or my pants on the right way. It's back to front, it's inside out. We have one lady with PCA recently who um, put her jeans fully on the wrong way round to the extent that she was zipping them up at the back rather than at the front um, because of the complex spatial arrangement. Because in PCA, it's not just about seeing where things are, it's about, it's a multi-sensory deficit. So the perception of, of, of space generally, including perception of body position and body movement is very challenging. So things which are not only visual, but multisensorily and spatially complicated, like getting dressed, cause particular problems for people with PCA. And another thing people uh, uh, with PCA absolutely hate are transparent or semi-transparent objects. So lots of people with PCA say things like, oh, in order to tell whether my car window is open or closed, I have to feel I have to touch to see if the glass is there. Um, lots of people knocking over wine glasses or glasses of water at the table because they can't 
perceive exactly their location and things like a rotating glass door as as pictured here would be the ultimate nightmare for someone with pca because it requires multiple of these cognitive um, skills listed at the side which are impaired and um, so lots of these real world scenarios create problems for people with pca because they draw on multiple deficits and um, that their pca has given them and just to just to say um, our colleagues, um, Jason Warren and Jeremy Johnson and others um, have pulled together a series of these red flags, not just for PCA, but for a variety of other rare dementias. Um, and for PCA, a couple of the other red flags that they pulled out is um, people, for example, being able to uh, read the fine print, but not the headlines of their newspaper because of a reverse size effect that I'll mention a bit more in a minute. Another classic is being able to perceive location better for moving objects than for static objects. So for example, playing tennis, it seems totally counterintuitive that someone with PCA, such as the person in the video I showed you earlier, could hit a tennis ball. But actually, it seems that the perception of and the localization of a moving object in that parallel sense of parallel strands of the visual system can often be calculated more accurately than something that's static. The bottom apraxia is an allusion to the, the problem we talked about earlier of someone having difficulty sitting down or perceiving where to sit. The pigeon sign is someone, if you show someone with PCA an object, a picture, for example, often you'll see this sort of head turning movement because they know they can't quite perceive it as clearly as they can. And so naturally they start trying to take different views from different angles of that object. And the tie sign again goes back to that video with Jonathan shot where sometimes you'd say, can you can you, you know, grab my hand or touch my nose? And someone will reach out and grab the tie of the clinician um, uh, because of this spatial um, uh, disorientation. So just moving down to the bottom of the clinical um, consensus classification, sorry, the research uh, diagnostic consensus classification quickly. So those light blue squares were at the syndromic level, these darker blue um, ovals at the bottom are the disease level. So saying, okay, that's the syndrome, but what's the underlying cause? And you can see from the thick arrows um, here at the bottom that the most common cause of PCA is Alzheimer's disease, but it can be caused by Lewy body disease, corticobasal degeneration, and a small number of other much, much rarer um, causes. But as I say, Alzheimer's disease is overwhelmingly the most common cause. When you look um, for evidence of um, molecular biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease, you, you see these sorts of distinctive patterns. And um, so um, over here at the bottom, you've got Hib across the brain, seemingly an early feature. It's globally present in people with PCA, whereas FDG PET and Tau PET um, seem to lead um, to this more characteristic posterior profile that you see with relative sparing of the typical medial temporal memory areas um, in PCA. Um, and we were also interested that um, in a fantastic international collaborative study led um, by Marianne Chaplot and Gil Rabinovich um, at UCSF, they've collected together now a huge sample of people living with PCA, so over, over 1,100 um, individual patients um, with PCA and found that um, with the subset of those who've come to autopsy, the vast majority, 92%, have Alzheimer's disease um, as the underlying pathology, uh, whereas the, and that's in, in, in all PCA cases, um, and sorry, that's in PCA pure cases, and in the PCA plus cases, the people who fulfill the PCA criteria, but also a criteria for another clinical syndrome, and those were the people who are much more likely to be amyloid negative. So I think for PCA pure at least, Alzheimer's disease is overwhelmingly the most common cause. And that's the, reflected in the fact that um, things that syndromes such as PCA and also others such as logopenic variant, PPA, LPA, um, are now clearly represented within broader um, Alzheimer's disease um, research diagnostic and clinical diagnostic criteria. So PCA is the most common atypical form of Alzheimer's disease. Um, just very briefly also to mention, still much to learn about the genetics um, of PCA. PCA seems to very, very rarely be inheritable. We've only, there are only one or two 
and plausible case studies of people with a family history of PCA. Um, but what does seem to be the case is that people with PCA and a couple of other atypical variants or uh, syndromes of young onset Alzheimer's disease seem less likely, perhaps slightly counterintuitive, seem less likely to have the APOE4 um, genotype. Um, they seem to be more likely to be E4 negative, these individuals, and that's come from a, a variety um, of different studies. We've also done some very small scale but pilot um, genome-wide association studies, which have identified um, some of the candidate SNPs, which interestingly seem to be involved with things like um, development of the, and maturation of the visual system. But I think this is an area where there'll be greater clarity over time as we try and unpick why can Alzheimer's disease affect different people in such different ways? Why does Alzheimer's disease in people with PCA predominantly affect the back of the brain? Should we think of this as a vulnerability, particularly of the occipital and parietal cortices? Should we think of this as a relative sparing or protective factor, um, protecting the medial temporal lobes and leaving the the uh, back of the brain relatively vulnerable. We don't know quite yet, but with these sorts of international efforts, we'll be able to get greater clarity on that as we go forward. Okay, just a couple of other things to mention in, the, in that wider sort of Alzheimer's disease spectrum is that I showed you um, at the beginning this, this um, figure at the bottom of this classical posterior um, occipital parietal pattern of atrophy. And it's just to note that in recent years, a number of other larger scale studies in people with more common and later onset forms of Alzheimer's disease have in a subset of people identified a similar posterior pattern. So whether that's using MRI, whether that's using tau-PET, um, you start to see these uh, patterns in a subset of patients. So people are beginning to recognize that being, if you like, PCA if to having prominent visuospatial um, difficulties, um, even if memory was your initial presenting symptom, is actually quite a common subtype of, of normal Alzheimer's disease, with estimates ranging from 10 to 30 percent. Um, so that uh, Vogel um, image in the center from lecture medicine, um, that's using an automatic classifying um, technique to identify subtypes, um, imaging subtypes of Alzheimer's disease. Um, other, other approaches have used a more clinical approach. Um, and I think you get this, you get this sense of alignment that those individuals within the so-called typical Alzheimer's spectrum who do seem to have these more prominent visual problems also turn out to be less likely to be APOE4 positive. So again, a little bit of alignment and a sense that PCA is the end, is not a distinct category in itself, it's the end of a, of a phenotypic spectrum or the edge of a phenotypic spectrum. Um, and so there are lots of people out there who will have quite a lot of visual impairment. It won't be the leading symptom enough to get them a diagnosis of PCA, but we need to not neglect um, the visual impairment that they're demonstrating. This image uh, was just to show that there are also a subset of people. Uh, if, so there's heterogeneity within the whole Alzheimer's spectrum, but there's also heterogeneity just within the PCA syndrome as well. So this was an, a study in which uh, we split um, our PCA sample um, into individuals who had particularly prominent um, motor, motor signs um, indicated by prominent dystonia. Um, uh, and those who did not have those prominent motor signs. And so we found these prominent motor signs in about a third of our patients. Um, and it's interesting that, for example, in these parietal regions, the, the patients with the greater motor signs seem to have greater asymmetry, greater um, loss of um, tissue in the right parietal region. Um, so the sense that, again, in, within this heterogeneity, it's not only that um, some people are more likely to have greater atrophy in the very posterior regions, but also in terms of laterality, there's also some heterogeneity in terms of how bilateral or unilateral um, this disease is. Um, this image is just to also remind you that 
as noted in the diagnostic criteria of Dubois, PCA is not the only atypical Alzheimer's disease subtype. Um, LPA, logopenic progressive aphasia, is also prominent, um, a prominent and noticeable subtype of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and this was just a comparison with John Rohr and colleagues um, of, the, of the linguistic profile. Um, so people with PCA absolutely complain about these visual and multisensory spatial difficulties early and the dyslexia and the dyscalculia, but also the, the next the sort of next rank of symptoms they often complain about is things like word finding difficulty. And in this um, series, it seemed that it's a very much a posterior uh, language syndrome that they have. So particular difficulty with processing auditory input, with repetition, whereas comprehension, the more anterior and semantic elements of language seem relatively spared. So for example, people with PCA seem to respond quite well to phonemic cueing when they're struggling to name something, just give a little bit of a sound cue, um, and that can be enough to um, prompt um, ac access to um, existing and intact semantic representations. Um, also, occasionally you will see people who don't present with prominent visual symptoms. So we talked about laterality just now. This is someone who presented um, with greater left than right parietal atrophy. And so what we saw is a, a clear cluster of difficulty with arithmetic, with spelling, with reading, and a little bit with naming. But on our visual tests, they were within normal limits on every test except one of our object perception tests. And so it's just to throw out there that the PCA syndrome, it really is, it's a posterior syndrome, not just a visual syndrome. Um, and so sometimes those initial deficits present um, with, with the more sort of dominant parietal um, pattern. Um, in the few minutes that are left, I think about uh, five or six minutes left, I was just going to run through a few um, uh, features and manifestations. Just to say in the slides I'll send around, there's a uh, link to this animation, which is uh, a visual animation um, uh, voiced by people living with PCA, which is a great way of getting a sense of some of the different everyday problems and disturbances of vision that people with PCA experience, which will cover things like color after images um, that we've talked about a little bit. Um, I thought I'd mention this quickly. This is visual crowding. So essentially a, an enhanced difficulty in people with PCA in central vision um, with um, perceiving objects that are surrounded by clutter. Um, so what this discovery of this was in a patient in whom I was doing actually doing a memory test and I showed them the first word they had, I was just gonna show them a list of words and the first word I think was something like sand. And they said, I can see the S and I can see the D, I can see the outside letters, but I can't see the letters in the middle. And so that put us on to the fact that in people with PCA in particular, they have, whereas all of us in our periphery have this crowding problem where you have to create enough space between the target you're looking at and any surrounding flankers in order to perceive it clearly. They have that problem, but right in their central vision. So for example, on tests such as these, where you just have to name the central letter, um, it's only when you space out these, these items that people with PCA can act accurately perceive um, that central letter. We talked a little bit about um, the difficulty um, with large, oh, sorry, with, with large print. Um, so this story was from a patient of Nick Fox's in his clinic, who again illustrated the difficulty of getting a diagnosis um, because he was still working, but the early visual um, symptoms he noticed was that he was sat on the train on the way to work one day and noticed that he could read the small print of his newspaper, but he couldn't read the headlines. And yet when he looked further down the carriage, someone else who had the same newspaper, he could read their headlines. And that sounds really counterintuitive because if you have any kind of visual problem, the first thing people will suggest is make it bigger. Actually for people with PCA, sometimes the reverse is true. They have, we have, a, they have a reduced effective field of vision. So that anything that's so large that you have to take multiple fixations or where within one constricted fixation, you can't absorb the relevant information, um, then it's very, very difficult for them to perceive. And we've seen this um, with in this um, reverse size effect um, in PCA, but not in Alzheimer's disease or, or health controls. And the implications of this is, for example, when you send someone with PCA 
to uh, to get their vision tested, some of the letters there are simply too big for them to see, as shown in this image here. They just are more accurate. The smaller something is within limits of acuity, the more accurate they are. Whereas at the bottom of the chart, the letters are the right size, but you've got this crowding problem because unlike at the top, there's not just one image, there's a whole slew of them. And so simple adaptations like giving people just a single letter of decreasing size is the tool you need in order to accurately assess visual acuity um, in people with PCA without being confronted with these size effect or crowding problems. Um, I'm just going to mention one more of these. Um, so another interesting thing in that clinical description at the very beginning from Frank Benson's patient, he described um, the fact that sometimes things will just disappear before your eyes. Um, and, uh, we've had this phenomenon described to us a number of times, so we did an experiment in which we asked people to um, simply look at a, a dot on a screen while we did eye tracking on them. And when you do this with healthy controls, you and I can maintain our fixation on our dot fairly accurately. People with typical Alzheimer's disease do it pretty well, but have these small square wave jerks. In people with PCA, you see not only these small square wave jerks, but sometimes you see these massive saccadic intrusions. So sometimes, even though they're fully intent, they understand that they've got to keep their eyes on a spot, sometimes their eyes will just flick away. And I think that's where this experience of something disappearing comes from. You're looking at something, you're, suddenly your eyes flick without, not in your voluntary control, and you end up looking at a different area of space. The perception is that that thing has disappeared. The reality is you, you just, without realizing it, moved your gaze to somewhere else um, in space. Um, but it's these sorts of stories from people with PCA which illustrate how we can understand more about the underlying condition. Um, and just finally, there's, just, um, there's, I think, significant implications, obviously, for people, for people with PCA with everyday life. When you do things like the Cambridge Behavioral Inventory with people with PCA, unsurprisingly, it's these everyday skills um, and self-care aspects of everyday life that they really, really struggle in. Because as, as lots of people with PCA or particularly their partners say, for people with PCA, because of their preserved intelligence, insight, memory, often with a tiny bit of help, people can do most things. But without that tiny bit of help, they're incredibly disabled in everyday life. Reading is just one, one of the examples. This is the eye movements of someone trying to read this passage uh, of text. Um, hence, we've created a visual aid um, to reading um, led by um, Ida Suarez Gonzalez. Um, but also, as we've talked about, it's not only seeing where something is that can be difficult, but it's a much more multi-sensory um, experience. One of our patients um, had to ask her daughter, am I the right way up? And this reflects this disordered um, connection um, between in things like verticality perception because of a, a failure of the brain to integrate or pr appropriately weight these different senses. And so lots of people with PCA describe phenomena like this. Um, so they will say things like, oh, I was walking along the pavement and I felt like I was about to fall off the edge of the world. So they might walk upright but feel like they're unbalanced. Other people, it's the reverse. Um, partners say, oh, I can't bring my partner to the support group meeting um, because when we walk now, he walks um, tilted over to one side. And I say to him, darling, stand up straight. And he says, I am. And similarly, in people with more advanced PCA, often you'll find them slumping to one side in their chair. And it's not a motor weakness thing. It's genuinely that their perception of what is upright is a complicated calculation which can no longer be made accurately. Um, I'll move on. There are various things to do with lighting that we've explored um, to try and improve and support people at homes. This one I'll just show you just to say that people with PCA have particular difficulty with shadows they get, often get perceived as, as pits or holes that people won't approach. And so in this task in which people are just trying to walk to the open door um, and we just change the direction of the lighting, people were much faster to walk to the door and much less likely to have these big hesitations shown by these orange circles. 
when there were no shadows cutting across their path. So even simple things like changing the direction or the position of a light within a room might make the difference between someone being able to move easily to the bathroom and back as opposed to not. Um, and, and in this article, again, which I'll send around by Emma Harding and Keir Yong, we just listed out a number of the uh, strategies um, that people have um, either told us that they find useful um, or that we are in the habit of um, proposing um, to other people, such as simplifying the environment, using certain types of visual cue, making good use of preserved colour vision by using brightly coloured stickers to mark out particular key locations to enable people to keep doing the activities that are important to them. So I will come to an end there just to say that, conclude that um, cortical visual impairments are very common, not just in PCA. PCA gives us this fantastic window into understanding dementia related visual impairment more generally. Um, but this is uh, so you may see the most extreme visual problems um, in people with PCA, but other dementias, they're very prevalent as well. So I hope so hearing some of these stories can kind of alert you to um, that aspect of a patient's common experience. And um, PCA is absolutely most commonly caused by Alzheimer's disease. So I think, again, they also provide a window not into to their own condition, but to how we more broadly understand why Alzheimer's disease affects the brain in the way it does and affects the brain so differently in so many people. Um, I don't think there's much evidence of kind of clear um, PCA subtypes. There's lots of heterogeneity, but it's very much sort of different points on a spectrum rather than distinct um, categories. Um, there are these key signs that we talked about, these red flags, getting lost when reading a page, your bottom apraxia, et cetera, et cetera. Um, which I think are useful clinical tools for those of us meeting people um, in, a, in a clinical environment where we're trying to pick up and determine these things. Um, and really just to say that I talked about informal PPI there, I haven't really had a chance to talk about it, but so much of the research that we've, we've done and many others have done into conditions like PCA has started with the patient, has started with their stories, their experiences, which has alerted us um, to some aspect, some facet of their condition, which we wouldn't have thought about previously. So like that comment, am I the right way up, leading to a whole slew of collaborations and investigations in the movement lab to try and tease apart why is it that, some, that the sense of balance, the sense of verticality can be so very challenging for people with PCA. Um, so anyway, I will say thank you very much. Thanks so much for your attention, for being here. Um, and of course, very happy to share these slides um, after the event um, and to take any questions. And that goes for at other times after today as well. Thank you. Good to see you back. Thank you. Yeah, we thanks uh, Professor Crutch, a wonderful talk. Now are his presentation open for discussion. Any questions or comments from our audience? Yeah, I, uh, I have the questions. Uh, you show a lot of uh, uh, examination tools to identify the PCA patients. Uh, uh, my, my, uh, because we are not the expert of uh, PCA, so uh, can you suggest some uh, useful, uh, most useful tools for us to identify PCA patients? Thank you. Yes, certainly. So we will be, my colleague here, um, after the um, International Alzheimer meeting in Amsterdam in a couple of weeks, we'll be sending round the latest version of the kind of the toolkit of collective wisdom that different people, you know, people favorite tests. So he's collecting an online folder, um, it, which includes where we can, uh, for copyright reasons, um, examples of the, the tests, the images that people most frequently use in their different um, uh, different clinical settings, along with the, the rationale for that. For us, as I mentioned, that fragmented letter test is one that we're uh, very much wanting to make freely available to people. And, and it, we also recommend it because so many ophthalmologists and others do have um, the Ishihara or something like that already within within their toolkit. Um, so I do think that's an absolutely key thing. But but so many of the things that we've talked about today, you you don't need any equipment for. It's about asking those right questions. It's about um, prompting people to say, um, do you have any difficulty with you know reflective surfaces um, when it's bright light? 
how do you manage you know going through glass doors you know prompting people to go oh yeah and then to to tell you a story which aligns with some of the difficulties so so that's the other key thing that we'll share is is that list of kind of red flags and and, and questions to ask um, which I think are useful if you, if you begin to get a hint that there's a strong kind of visual history. Okay, thank you. Uh, the first, uh, the, 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 the second question is, it's imaging, uh, imaging uh, visual experience, uh, sorry. Uh, Imaginary visual, visual experience. Visual experience, yeah. Yeah, that's a, read, absolutely. Please. So that's a great, a great question. So the question is about imaginary visual experience, visual memory, are they preserved in PCA? So it's an excellent question. So uh, no, in this, essentially is the answer. Um, we don't know very much about imagery in PCA, um, but we know enough to say that, as, as your question suggests, you're absolutely right, that PCA does not just affect explicit kind of live vision, um, but it also affects the ability to imagine a visionary world, to inspect or move around within, within imagery. So, for example, um, Lots, uh, uh, I think it was Brad Dickerson's group in Massachusetts did a nice study in which they asked people to imagine certain scenes um, and then to describe what they saw. Um, and there was much less visual detail in the descriptions of people with PCA than with people with typical um, Alzheimer's disease. From our end, we've also done some work looking at the um, impact of different types of memory test on people with PCA. So as, as you will all be aware, lots of standard memory tests involve, for example, a kind of a shopping list of items. Most of those items are concrete physical things. And how do most of us do those tests? We imagine them in different combinations. We use strategies to help us to recall them. And people with PCA have great difficulty with using imagery to create those kind of associations. And so in people with PCA, you see that they have, they're much more likely to have normal uh, performance on memory tests where they're tests of recognition, where you're saying, did, you know, for example, did I say to you X or Y, than if they have to spontaneously recall items using those kind of imagery and other um, cues. So I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's, it's internal vision, not just external. Okay, you can uh, re read the, the third question. No problem. So the next why one is, is uh, oh, sorry, why, it's just. Uh, yeah. Why is the most comfortable font size or natural arrangement for people with PCA re to read, at least uh, for most of them? Yeah. An another excellent question. So it's, it's sort of normal font size, so kind of font 12, font 14 maximum. Um, so their vision obviously will be limited by acuity like the rest of us. So if you showed them, you know, font size six or something, <laughs> lots of people with PCA would be struggling. Um, but it's so it's about font size. So some of our patients before we discovered this would go off to their local library and get so-called easy to read books, which are larger font size, and they would actively find those unhelpful. Um, so yeah, fairly, fairly normal, um, as I say, font 12, font 14 um, size print is best, but it's also about how how the words are presented. So that visual uh, reading aid that I mentioned um, called Read Clear, one of the things that does is give you an option about how many words are presented at the same time. Because when you look at people with PCA doing paragraph reading, they're much more likely to read the words around the edge of the paragraph better. The words in the middle of the paragraph, which are so surrounded by other letters, are harder. So if you can present words in chunks or with spaces between, or if you can use, some people choose to cut a hole in a piece of paper and just read one line at a time, for example, they find that helpful. Okay. Um, the it, question is the prominent visual symptom take the lead before other cognitive deficit. Are uh, most of our PCA syndrome developed multi domain co cognitive deficit? Could uh, I should autopsy a result uh, being too late? 
it will more likely with a spreading pathway. Um, yes, yeah, so um, there is a lot of, he well, we don't know, we haven't had as many longitudinal studies of PCA as we would like, mm -hmm. but it definitely seems that there is heterogeneity, not only in terms of which symptom comes first. So for example, some people with PCA have a more dorsal initial pattern of atrophy, some people are more inferior pattern of atrophy. So some may have greater spatial problems, some greater difficulty with object perception. But also in terms of how that progresses over time, my personal experience, as your question suggests, is absolutely there are some people who seem to have where the, the rate of spread to other brain regions is much, much slower. So I've met people who are still living independently at home 10, 12 years after a diagnosis, virtually functionally blind, but with their language, their memory and their insight still very preserved. Other people who after two or three years have had initial visual problems, it's rapidly progressed to affect memory, disexecutive skills, etc. And they have quite a global dementia syndrome quite quickly. So it's one of the factors, um, be it genetic or other, that we need to explore is why do you get those, those different rates? And you're absolutely right that the pathological studies are really, really helpful. Um, and I guess I just bring you back to it not just this not just being a question in PCA specifically, but in Alzheimer's disease in general. Melissa Murray's work, for example, has shown very clearly that there is a lot of heterogeneity um, in pathological studies of people even with memory-led Alzheimer's disease. You've got some people who've got this um, hippocampal um, kind of an enterinal focused pathology some people who seem to have relative sparing of those regions and other people who have a more kind of global distribution of, of pathological change. Yeah. Um, the, the question is, uh, do you recommend EEG in examination among patients suspected with PCA? Uh, since not every uh, institute have a PET scan or a functional MRI. Um, yeah, it's not something we do particularly routinely, I've got to say. Um, but yeah, you, there are some there are some clear papers out there that show that kind of loss of alpha wave and um, can give you a clearly a kind of clear signal as to posterior dysfunction. So some people would use it, obviously not not as specific as some of the other measures you mentioned. But yes. Okay. Uh, then, with regard um, to our testing battery, would you uh, suggest the more car over MMSE? Uh, no, not not particularly. Um, I think both, uh, ne obviously neither of those um, batteries are designed for people with PCA um, and both include visual elements um, or use visual stimuli to test non-visual skills. So, um, uh, you know, in the MOCA, the, the picture naming someone with PCA is likely to struggle with, not because they've got necessarily a strong word retrieval deficit, but just they, just they can't see the picture. Whereas obviously most clinicians, most of us would look at that and we would provide a verbal description of the thing and then the patient would be able to name it. So I think all of these tools need to be used kind of carefully and with, with clinical skill. Um, but yeah, there are items within both, you know, within the MMSE, the figure copy, the writing, um, the calculating backwards or spelling um, spelling backwards, those are tasks which will absolutely pick up on um, PCA relevant deficits. Yeah. Regarding the treatment, what treatment would you suggest for these patients? Do you think a uh, uh, calling uh, esterase inhibitor show benefit or other anti-amyloid medications? Yeah, another great question. We absolutely think that, um, as you as you saw in the pathological data, the vast majority of people with POPCA have Alzheimer's disease, and as far as we are aware, any anti-amyloid treatment or any other Alzheimer's disease targeting therapy should be as helpful for someone with PCA as for someone with any other um, phenotype um, or kind of presenting syndrome associated with underlying Alzheimer's disease. So yes, we absolutely recommend a trial of cholinesterase inhibitors for our patients. Um, and 
just as with everyone else, for some people, they say that makes the difference between a kind of a taking their pills makes the difference between a kind of a, a good day, a sunny day and a cloudy day um, in terms of their in terms of their vision. Um, and we absolutely are campaigning for, as are many colleagues in the states, to make sure that people with PCA are not excluded from, um, for example, the anti-amyloid trials, all of the disease-modifying therapies. I think that we just need to make sure that the outcome measures are appropriate for people with PCA and that they're not excluded, um, but not because the, the drug won't work, but because we don't have a very good way of measuring whether the drug has worked. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Crouch. Because we have uh, run out of our time, uh, we thank uh, Professor Crouch uh, uh, again, and uh, we hope uh, you can visit Taiwan uh, in the near future. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Again. Thank you so much for inviting me. And yes, I'd love to come back to your beautiful country another time. Thanks okay, again. Bye. Have a good day, everyone. Bye. Okay, bye. -bye.